Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. Father, we pray for that kind of anointing oil to be poured over this place today and over the heads of all who have gathered here in your name. the oil of gladness of being united with Christ and the oil of humility that comes through the unity of the body of Christ lord may that oil also soften the hardness of our hearts so that we would humbly bow before you confessing sins and humbly bowing before one another learning to love Father we pray that we would bring you delights when you look upon this church as unity delights the heart of the Father in heaven we pray that our ministry would delight your heart deeply and Father we are far from that so often because of our sin and selfishness and so that is why we need your grace even now to turn us from our flesh and to walk by faith as we trust in you. And so come Holy Spirit, soften hearts and ready lives to be changed by the power of your word today. May we leave here changed and more in love with Jesus and more like Jesus. So as the world sees us, they will see you in us. And God, I pray for your strength and your grace and your mercy. to fill me anoint me empower me and holy spirit that you would preach through me today life giving words that will bring honor to Jesus Christ so let the words of my mouth the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight o lord our rock and our redeemer and it is in your precious name we pray amen if you've ever watched the uh, show friends that it means you're old like me. You know, I still remember when I first heard about that show, I knew it was going to be a hit even based on the name Friends. Um because it tapped into people's hearts and it revealed really what people are longing for, friendship and community. You know, the show's success was in large part due to the, due to the fact that they were showing each week what everybody was longing for each day. and that was true friendship connection intimacy to be known and loved by others because that's what we're wired for and you know that's a big reason also why in um our modern day the crossfit movement uh amongst those who work out is so huge and popular globally uh, because what they do is not just exercise because if they, all they did was exercise it would not be very popular just like most gym uh gyms are not popular except for January 1st um but the reason why the, the crossfit movement is so huge globally is because they've also integrated within the culture of their working out community and connectedness even outside of the gym and so the if you guys know people are into it you know that they're really into it and it is because they have found community in that place uh and you would think in light of this longing for community and connection uh social media would be a positive element in this but that's actually a strange factor in this modern era uh of longing for community you see thanks to social media uh we have never been as outwardly connected to each other in human history being able to share information photos uh to keep in touch with what's going on in people's lives 
But studies have found that social media actually creates a false sense of community.、Uh, you see, thanks to social media, we now can know what's going on in our friends and family members' lives without really knowing them. You see, it is through the sharing of heart-to-heart communication that a deep connectedness really happens. And another thing that media, social media,、uh, has done for us is it has taught us how to be inauthentic. What do I mean?、Um, in many ways, how we communicate through social media and even in texting, it teaches us not to be real. Um, the images that we are portraying in our、uh, social status photos on Facebook, Twitter, whatever,、uh, we get to control it. Right? We control everything:、uh, what people know about us, what people see about us, and if there is a picture we don't like, you know, we delete it or we cut them out of our lives. Right?、Uh, we control it,、uh, but it, te- be- but because of that. It has taught us and almost trained us how to be inauthentic. You still don't believe me? All right. How about this? When we reply, either versus texting or social media, a lot of times we will put a smiley face when we're not smiling,、okay? or we will write LOL for laughing out loud when we're not laughing.、Right? Uh, we project what we think they want to see. Or how they think we should be responding, and so it has created a fascinating disconnect in a time where we have never been as connected before in human history. Now, this is important for us to understand because researchers have also discovered that if you, when you realize that you are really disconnected, meaning no one really knows. The real you, or when you feel no one really understands the real you, when that becomes a reality, it does damage for the human soul.、Uh, studies have found that if that is you, and you realize that you are not really connected to anyone,、uh, that person is two to three times more likely to die an earlier death, four times more likely to suffer emotional burnouts. Five times more likely to suffer from clinical depression, and ten times more likely to be hospitalized for an emotional or mental disorder. And so it shows us that human connection is good medicine for the heart, soul, and mind. In other words, this proves what the Bible already shows us, and that is that we are created for community. Some of you are introverts, and you might be like Eddie. No, I don't need community. Thank you. I am fine by myself. All right, you're an introvert. That's fine. But no one is made for isolation. We are created to be known by others and to know others, to enjoy life together within the context of community. And this is the value that we want to focus on today. We want to explore and, Lord willing, integrate more into the culture of this church. So we have one more week to go. Next week of our core value series, and Lord willing, we'll finish that next week, and then we'll head into Resurrection Sunday. And we do encourage you to invite your friends and loved ones to our service on Resurrection Sunday,、uh, so that they could hear the gospel and join us, Lord willing, for all of eternity in celebration of our Savior. But to review, as we do、uh, close off our core value series this week and next week, let's review、uh, what we've established so far to be the core values of OEM. And these are our values. We value here at OEM Christ and His gospel as everything. So Christ and His gospel message is first, foundational, and foremost of all that we do. We value opportunities to honor His presence. We want to be a people of His presence.、Uh, we value reaching the unreached to finish the mission. We value excellence in all things, giving to God our best. Out of worship and love for Him, because He is worthy, we value viewing the vulnerable as most valuable to God's hearts. We value aligning all things with Scripture, love as the mode of all things, and last week's value that we looked at was using our gifts to bless the body of Christ. And today, this is the value that we will unpack, and it is we value enjoying life together in community. So, everyone, repeat: We value enjoying life together. In community, 
So that's what we want to explore. So turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. We'll be looking at verses 42 to 47 as we explore this value of community for our ministry. So why do we value uh, community within our ministry? Because first of all, follow along with me in your outlines, it is because we are made for worship. So everyone repeat, we are made for worship. Now you might be like, hold on, I thought we were talking about fellowship and community. Where did this worship come from? Uh, You'll see the connection in a moment. You see, enjoying life begins with our community and our communion with God. Because the deepest joys in life come from our connection to Christ. Because in His presence is fullness of joy. Amen? It is in the presence of God where we find the deepest pleasures of life. And because of this, we see that the disciples were committed to worship as a community of faith. So let's look at Acts 2, 42 and 43. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the word of God, being taught, preached, proclaimed. And they commit, devoted themselves to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. So there is the word, there is praise, there is worship. And that was the central focus of their devotion. So the first place that we're meant to enjoy life together with in community is with God. He is the model and the means through which we enjoy life. God models community even within the Trinity. God is one but exist in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And they share a bond and a fellowship that has been enjoyed for all of eternity. And he extends that fellowship communion with us to join him in friendship. And it is in that trinity we are invited to join that community as well. How? Through worship, as we learn to enjoy his presence. So the first place that we're meant to enjoy life together in community is with God. He is the gift to be enjoyed, and he is the giver of all gifts that we enjoy. And you see, there is a connection with our enjoyment of God and our enjoyments with the fellowship that we share with others. You see, one of the reasons why community with God is vital for our community with others is because there is a correlation between our closeness with God and our closeness with God's people. I mentioned this concept during, uh, usually during like dating seminars and things like that, uh, but we need to understand this principle uh, like a triangle, uh, that there are three points in a triangle, and if the top point is God and the two base points would be me and another person. And as we strive to get closer to God, we will naturally also get closer to each other. Because as I share a common value of seeking first the kingdom of God, and that is my highest value, Christ and his gospel as everything, as I strive to seek after him first, his kingdom is righteousness, those whom I will connect with most quickly and closely will be those who share that same value of seeking first his kingdom, his righteousness. And that is one of the wisdom principles as to why believers are not to marry non-believers. Because the greatest foundational core of our existence is centered around our love for Jesus Christ. And so what Intimate relationships, especially in the context of marriages and families is supposed to picture, are the love that we are able to experience as we seek the highest priority of our lives together. And this is why some people bond so quickly. You know, I've noticed that people who have a deep love for prayer connect quickly with other people who have a deep love for prayer. And as I was reflecting upon the reasons for this, it is because they both dwell in the presence of God in the place of prayer, and they both seek the presence of God in the place of prayer. And that is a clear and classic example of how this triangle principle works out, especially for those who seek the Lord in his presence. So it is in that place of worship, of prayer, 
in his presence that true joy in life begins. And that's an important principle that we need to begin with and cannot just brush aside because community and fellowship is not just we have similar interests of games and activities and exercises. It is the common bond that we share of our love for Jesus that makes true biblical community. Amen? And that comes knowing that we were created for worship. And so that's where we need to begin. But our community is vital for another reason. That is because we are made for fellowship. So everyone repeat, we are made for fellowship. So let's look at Acts 2.42 again. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So again, to the word of God in the place of worship. So they devoted themselves to worship, but also they devoted themselves to the fellowship. Now, it's interesting to note that they, that they specifically mention their devotion and their commitment to the fellowship of believers. You see, there was devotion to the word, yes, but also there needs to be a devotion to his church. Because the mark of a faith-filled and spirit-filled community is also a devotion to the body of Christ. Because when you love God, you love the things that he loves. And Jesus passionately loves the church. Because the church is his bride. The church is who he died for. The church is who he will come to return for one day. So lovers of Jesus will also love the church despite the imperfections, despite the huge mistakes that the church makes. True lovers of Jesus will also have a reverence and a love for the church as well. And fellowship within the church is ultimately about loving God's family. We enjoy life most when this love is experienced in the family of faith. So look at Acts 2, 44 and 45. And, they, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, day attending to the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. So becoming a healthy believer and a healthy church means growing in opportunities to enjoy each other's company and get to know each other better. So one basic level of entering into the fellowship or the community of faith in the local church would be membership. Membership is when we choose to commit to a local body. Uh, so you see, once we become Christians, we are all members of the global church, capital C. But when uh, we are also uh, believers, what we need beyond that is to find a local church, small c, uh, to commit to and to be a part of. We were meant to be floating from one church to another because neither side will benefit. The church will not benefit from you, and you will not fully benefit from the community of saints there either. You know, during my sabbatical year um, in Australia, uh, we went from church to church each week uh, because I finished my time at the previous ministry. And we were looking for the right fit, which was really hard to do. Um, we started with the church closest to us, which was, which was literally right across the street. Now, that church had about 70, uh, 80 people, and you could tell that they really were tight-knit by the way that they interacted with each other before and after service. And it was clear that we were the new ones because nobody would talk to us, and they all talked to each other. And it was also clear after two weeks of attending that we were not really welcome because I'd introduce myself, and they'd be, oh, oh yeah, oh, hi, and they'd move on, you know. Uh, and so obviously we left. But I realized how empty it feels to not truly know people within a congregation. Uh, and it really made me miss the, the community that I was a part of before. And uh, the reason why I felt that way is because we were created to be known and to know others. We are created to serve and to serve others. We are created to love and to love others. That's what it means to truly be a community of believers. Because as the church gets bigger, we also need to think smaller. And what I mean by that is, uh, if you only come, up to, come to church on Sundays and that's it, you are not going to feel connected to this ministry, especially at this campus. There are way too many people for you to feel a connection with. 
And so as we get bigger, we also need to think smaller in terms of getting to know a smaller number of people, especially in small groups, through one-to-one, and in serving in a ministry context. That is one of the most practical ways to get your foot into the door of true community within your lives. And membership, OEM 101, is one way that we offer for you to have this basic entry-level step into community, and that is to commit to a local congregation um, of Christ. So membership is the basic first step in a fellowship. And if we want to go a little bit deeper beyond membership, that is when friendships are formed. So we begin with membership, but we also need to deepen it to friendships. Because what makes people feel most at home within a church is when friendships are made. One of the greatest ways to love the church and to love our neighbors as ourselves, even in this congregation, is to be a friend to someone, even today. Uh, What we see in Acts 2.44 are elements of this deepening friendship that is happening amongst all these people. Look at verse 44 again. It says, All who believed were together and had all things in common. Common ground is the basis of how we connect with friendships. But again, the biggest common bond would be our love for Jesus Christ. Verse 45, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending to the temple uh, together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. So they were meeting each other's needs. They were spending time together. They were eating together. And you know that eating together especially is a great way to bond together as well. This time together, sharing possessions together, this sharing of life together is what will deepen the community element for us as well. So membership is one level, friendship is another level, but the deepest level that God desires us to have is to even move beyond friendship to kinship. And that is when we learn to love like family. Romans 12.10 says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly and sisterly love. In other words, love like family in the family of faith. And this happens when you truly get to know others, even their sins and flaws, failures and mistakes. As you see the sins of others to extend grace and to receive grace, that is to experience true love, unconditional love. That's when you get a taste of what family is meant to be like in the fellowship of faith. You know, one of my favorite stories from Rick Warren is when a longtime friend at his church was in the hospital. He went to the hospital and said, I'm here to see my friend. I'm his pastor. To which the nurse replied, no, you're not. And Pastor Rick Warren was really offended. He's thinking, how in the world do you know whether I'm his pastor or not? And how can you even judge right away saying you're not his pastor? And when he inquired further, Uh, She said, you're the fifth person to walk in here today saying that you're his pastor. And he was very confused. He's like, no, really? I'm his pastor. Um, And when he did a little bit more inquiry, he found out later that um, several of this man who was in the hospital, of his previous small group leaders, uh, came and said that they were his pastors to care and love and look after him. And the reason why they did that was because Rick was doing a teaching series at the church recently, encouraging the congregation members to take ownership of this ministry, of this church, and to begin loving each other as shepherds, as spiritual fathers and mothers. And he challenged the small group leaders, too, to embrace their small groups as a mini church. And he says, love them as if you were their pastor. And that's what they did. And so when he found that out, he was so happy that he was rejected at the hospital. (laughs) Because what that showed is the church was doing what the church is supposed to be doing. And that is to even move beyond the level of friendships into family relationships as God intended. Amen? And I think that's a beautiful testimony of what the church is supposed to be like. And I love hearing stories from our own small groups in OEM. And when they experience what a true family is supposed to be like, when they travel together, experiment to find new restaurants together, but simply do life together, that's when they get a taste of what the family of faith was supposed to be like. Loving God, 
loving one another. And if you're not in a small group, again, we encourage you to get into one, plug into a ministry, plug into one-to-one discipleship, and let someone know you and get to know others. Because one of the saddest things to ever happen within a church is for you to attend just as a Sunday churchgoer for years, and then when a crisis happens in your life, no one knows about it, and you feel alone. Because it is important for us as a community of faith to know and to share in each other's lives and even our struggles so that we will know when there is needs and when there are needs for us to be a blessing of love in your deepest time of need. That is why the church exists. That is to love God deeply and to love the fellow family of faith deeply. Amen? That's why we're here. And so we need to understand we were wired for worship first. To know and be known by God. To experience the community that comes from knowing that God Almighty knows me and I can know Him. And then it flows from that need of worship to our need of fellowship. Of embracing each other as family. And it goes even further because he does, Jesus not only gives us a family to enjoy, he also gives us a mission to be on. And that leads us to our third point, and that is that we are made for partnership. So everyone repeat, we are made for partnership. So life is to be enjoyed through worship as we encounter God. Life is to be enjoyed as we experience what family is like through the family of faith. And life brings on new levels of joy and fulfillment as we learn to partner together in the mission of Christ. In verse 42 of Acts 2, we saw how they were devoted and committed to the fellowship. Now, the word used here for fellowship is koinonia, and you've probably heard that word often in the Greek. It's mentioned about 20 times in the New Testament, and the main meaning behind this word koinonia actually carries the idea of partnership and participation within a group of people for a common good. So partnership is when we have true fellowship. Participation by all the people within the group is when we have true fellowship. So true fellowship is when there are people who are partnering together and participating together for the cause of Christ. And, that, and what we read in verse 47 is the byproducts of their being on mission with God together. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So they were committed to Christ to each other, and they were committed to sharing this gospel message who who did not hear it yet. And that common mission led to a great fruitfulness in the growth of the church. Because as they sought God together, as they loved one another, people were drawn to Christ as a result. So I encourage you to get on mission with God by serving the church, by serving the city, and by serving the nations. You know, two of my closest friends in my life that I grew up with, their names are uh, Bobby and KJ. We grew up in the same church ever since we were young in elementary school. And uh, we were always friends, uh, but what took our friendship to new levels of depth and joy was when we started to serve the youth group together. Uh, You see, when we were in grade 11 and 12, our junior and senior year in high school, uh, we didn't have a youth pastor for much of that time. And so we had to function as the youth pastors and youth leaders within our group. And so we would call everyone, we would counsel them, check up on them, we'd plan uh, the summer and winter retreats. Uh, All three of us, we would hang out, pray, plan, evaluate, and plan some more. We loved it. Uh, We loved the group deeply, we loved each other deeply, and through it we were enjoying life together in community. And what was also neat is uh, we went to college together, the same college, and we maintained our friendship, uh, but because we got busy, we couldn't do much with the youth group until our junior and senior year in college. 
when they were without a youth pastor once again, and we got back together, and we decided to function, to be their caregivers once again. And so uh, we would partner together to serve these junior high and high school students. And I still remember the lock-ins uh, all night, realizing that I was getting old by not being able to keep up with these young kids, the retreats, and even the car washes that we would have. And at the end of every ministry events, we'd look at each other extremely exhausted and say, this is what life is about. Spending our strength, spilling our love in the service of the church. And it drew us closer and it drew more people closer to the Lord as well. You see, the gospel aim of community is to experience Christ, to share Christ with others, so that they too might experience the fellowship with the Father in heaven. Mark chapter 6, verse 7 says, And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Jesus sent out disciples two by two, not one by one because it is both wise and more enjoyable to be on mission with God together. And what is the ultimate partnership Christ wants us to share in? Finishing the mission he gave us to do in Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then he ends it by saying, behold, I am with you always. Don't forget that the communion with me will never depart from you. My presence will always be there because we need that place of intimacy with the Lord first to truly enjoy the life journey that we are on. You know, some of the deepest joys and deepest friendships that I've formed over the years have come from partnering together in ministry, in church, but especially on short-term mission trips. I, I was... Uh, just thinking about this in preparation for this message this past week, and I realized that I've been on mission trips with almost every pastor in OEM, almost, and a lot of the pastor's wives as well. Uh, pastor Mike Kim and Jane, um, our times on the mission field is when we really got to know each other. I realized how much Jane can eat is more than most guys I know, and I realized how fast Mike Kim eats. He can swallow food, he could drink food, he could drink a turkey, okay? I don't know how he does it, but he has a gift. Uh, Andy's wife, Eunice, we've went, uh, who just gave birth last week, we've uh, gotten to know each other deeply on mission trips. Pastor Matt Hong, who is our outreach pastor, uh, it was through our time uh, training for missions together, seeing him in action, being a uh, servant through training others, that uh, he's a big reason why he's on our staff now. And one thing that you may not know, uh, my parents don't even know, and so they watch our services, and now they'll know what this thing, and my mom will probably worry some more. But Pastor Joel and I, we actually went on, uh, were on missions together in China, and um, one of our friends was doing some ministry there on the border between China and North Korea. And uh, we were at the lake, this river between, and um, we were like, hey, it'd be so funny if we swam there. And he was like, my, our friend who did ministry there was, oh, go ahead, swim. I swim there all the time. He's like, are you sure it's safe? He's like, oh, yeah, I do that all the time. Go. And so Joel and I, we went in, and we're swimming until we heard uh, the sound of some guy screaming from the North Korean border and they were running with machine guns. And I didn't understand what they were saying, but I was pretty certain they wanted us out. Because when they were pointing the machine guns, we're like, okay, I don't think we're supposed to. And then our friend, and we were like, what the heck, you told us it's safe. He's like, that never happened before. Like, that never happened before. So uh, we, we've, we bonded really deeply on that trip when we realized that might have been our last moments of our life together. And even uh, Joel's wife, uh, Sharon, we grew up together in the same church as well. So uh, there's a lot of the staff members, uh, we were on missions together, and that's what really bonded us together. And I think that is a big reason why uh, they're on staff. It is because we connected on that way. And actually, Pastor Mike Lee as well, he was a missionary in Guam, and we did missions there uh, for, before, and we served together uh, there. Uh, and those are still some of the greatest memories, and for different reasons, 
um, you know, some of the most greatest memories that I've experienced. You see, there's nothing like serving God on the mission field to bring people closer together. Waking up early at 4 or 5 a.m., exercising for a good hour, doing devotions together and praying together all before the sun rises, cooking for each other, serving each other, sharing the gospel together, performing skits and dramas to convey the gospel, praying for people to receive Christ together, learning how to sacrifice for one another. And when someone on the team gets sick, for the whole team to rally around them, pray for them and carry them, squeezing and pushing 17 people into a taxi made for 10 while people are hanging out on the sides. You're never going to forget those moments especially when you're the one hanging out from the side. <laughs> After a long day of ministry, seeing the team memorize verses together for fear of push-ups, in that taxi, laughing, singing, sleeping on each other's shoulders, while the sun is setting and the cool breeze is blowing, then eating a great dinner because I didn't cook it, sharing lessons that we learned throughout the day at the closing of our meeting for the night, singing and praying late into the night, interceding for the people we are ministering to, interceding and fighting for the nations together. Doing that for a few weeks together will create a beautiful bond like nothing else. And I assure you, you ask anyone who's been on short-term missions in this church and this ministry, they will also testify that the bonds that get created through that experience is like no other. And that is why our vision for missions is to send out teams to the nations, not just individuals. We want to send out teams because that is both wise and the deepest joy way, the deepest joys will, ex will be experienced through that way as well. Uh, because some of the biggest challenges to the mission field is loneliness and a lack of community. But the reason why short-term missions is such a blessing so many times is because you are doing life together, serving together, suffering together, on mission together. And you see, the stronger the community, the stronger the joy. And partnering together to serve Christ is one of the best ways to strengthen community and thereby strengthening joy. Your life will never be the same again as you spend your life fully in service to the Lord. And so with your friends, pray together for the nations. With your friends, go on mission trips together. Vision cast together for the nations. Pray about going to another Korea, country after Korea together. That vision is what led the Isan team to form uh, as they embraced this vision and decided after their time in Korea, they would together be on mission with God in Isan, Thailand. And so that is our desire for you to experience this depth of joy through depths of community on being on mission with God. So it is in the place of worship we must begin, enjoying God, his presence, and his fellowship. And from that place, we begin connecting with others who also share a love for Christ and his kingdom. And our joy in finding our life purpose is realized as we partner together to finish the mission that Jesus gave us to do. It's about f enjoying life together, loving one another, but also when we do truly know each other and know the struggles and the times of sin and suffering that we do go through, then the great benefit that we have in community is we know when we need to fight for each other. We need that for true community to happen because we are in war and we need each other to fight for each other. Amen? I need you to fight for me in the place of prayer. There is so much warfare in this ministry, in, in every single justice initiative that we are striving to bring about justice and the gospel into in this country. There is so much warfare. I need your prayers. I need you to fight for me in the place of prayer. Amen? I need it. I kid you not. There is so much warfare. But also, you need people to be fighting for you. Therefore, people need to know what's going on in your life. And you need community as a result. And we need that kind of fight right now. 
One of our long-term missionary families in OEM, John and Rachel, they've been serving in Asia for a long time. They just found out a few days ago that their youngest son, Eric, who is still in elementary school, has a leukemia. They've been a part of our OEM community for many, many years. Uh, they've also been on the mission field in Asia for many, many years, reaching the unreached people groups throughout Asia. And so obviously it came as a total shock to uh, everybody uh, that their son was so weakened so quickly. And so they uh, are in the U.S. right now seeking therapy and treatment for him. And so we need to fight for Eric because they are our family. They need our love, they need our prayers, and they need us to fight for them and to fight with them in the place of prayer. Amen? And so let's do that even now. Let's learn to fight for our family members in the place of prayer. Can we pray for Eric now? Let's pray right now.